The context is, is the armour of God and it talks about these two weapons that the Lord has given us to be uh, weapons of offence. So they're offensive weapons for the church, for the community of God's people in the spiritual hostile world that we live in. And so last week I... Um, talked about what is the, the oh well uh, let me just show you the text remind you of the text it's take up the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and last week i talked about what is the sword of the spirit the word of god so what is paul talking about when he uses this phrase the sword of the spirit the word of god because here's the thing, if we don't understand what he means, then how can we pick it up? How can we take it up? How can we use it if we don't understand what he means by that? So last week I focused on what it means and it, it, where, where I got to was that it, it means that it's the spirit-inspired word that comes from God and is spoken out. That's what Paul's talking about when he uses this phrase, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's the Spirit-inspired Word from God that is spoken out. And it's not just that, but also specifically the message of Jesus. So we're in the New Testament. We're in New Testament times. So when the New Testament specifically talks, uses that phrase, the Word of God... It's using it in the context of Jesus having been sent to earth, having died on the cross, having been resurrected from the dead and then ascended to heaven and empowered the church with his spirit. In that context, when, the, when Paul talks about, uses the phrase of the word of God, it's used throughout the Bible, but when he uses it in the context of the New Testament, he's talking also specifically about the message of Jesus, the gospel. So that's really important to understand that. And that's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Central to the Word of God is the message of Jesus. It's not a message about what our politicians are going to do. Now, you may feel like, you know, God has spoken to you about things that are going to come in the future. Well, you know, every prophetic word needs to be tested. Right? And, and let me say... The, the, the Word of God, when, you know, the, when the Bible talks about the Word of God in the New Testament, it is talking about the message of Jesus. It's not talking about some personal situation that we're in or some political situation we're in. So, you know, I just thought I'd add that. But today, I'm going to talk about how is the Word of God used as a weapon. Because here's the thing. Paul says... It's a sword. It's, a, it's a, the sword of the Spirit. And he says to take it up. So we need to understand how we are meant to use uh, the Word of God as a weapon in the spiritual fight that we're in. Now, here's uh, something I want to mention. I mentioned last week, and I, I think I just, it's worth clarifying when we're talking about using the Word of God, what this phrase, the Word of God, as a spiritual weapon, the context of Ephesians chapter 6, we're not talking about, we're not just talking about reading the Bible. Okay? So some of us will have heard, well, you know, you should just read the Bible. That's the Word of God and, and you know, that's how you use it. Well, I, I don't think that's what Paul's talking about at all. Now, I believe in word, reading the Bible. I believe in reading the Bible. But that's not what Paul's talking about right here. It's not talking about uh, studying the Bible. Now, I believe in studying the Bible. I believe we all should study the Bible. But that's not what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians 6. And here's another thing. I don't think he's talking about teaching the Bible. 
Now, I believe in teaching the Bible. We should teach the Bible. Paul says three times in 2 Timothy, to, to Timothy, in three different ways, teach. I believe in teaching. But that's not what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 6. And so if we want to understand what the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God is, and how to use it, we need to look and understand what exactly he's talking about. So let me just, go, just um, elaborate a little bit more on this. I, I, I think I mentioned this last week, and it's, it's um, co co completely coincidental. It happens to be Pentecost Sunday today. Remember in Acts chapter 2, in Pentecost... Right, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples and they're filled with the Spirit. And then Peter gets up and he makes his speech to the, you know, his fellow Israelites in Jerusalem. And uh, what does he do? Well, when he starts to speak, he quotes from Joel chapter 2. Verses 28 to 32. So if you go into Joel chapter 2, 28, verses 28 to 32, you'll see there that he is quoting Joel there. And so when he gets up filled with the, sp with the Spirit and starts to speak, he is quoting from verse 22. Uh, sorry, from verse 28. Now here's the thing. This is not what he did. It, he wasn't going through the book of Joel with the disciples verse by verse. Okay, the day before Pentecost, we're on verse, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 27. It's now Pentecost. Let's now all turn in our Bibles to verse 28. That's not what happened. He wasn't doing a Bible study going verse by verse. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I've got no problem with that. But that is not what he did. What happened? The Holy Spirit inspired him, put Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32 in his heart, and at some point he'd been meditating on it. He'd been reading it and meditating on it. And then as the Spirit spoke to his heart, he spoke that word out. That's what the word of God is. Do you get it? See, when we're going through Bible studies, as legitimate as that is, it's not what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. He's talking about the Word of God that's spoken to our heart. The Holy Spirit inspires us in that moment and we speak it out. Context matters. If you ever do a, a course in... Bible hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. What, one of the th first things that they teach you is that context matters. We need to understand the context. Now, let me just read out the context of Paul's statement. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 12. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in heaven. This is the environment, the spiritual environment that Paul is talking about. He names five parts of this hostile spiritual world, doesn't he? There's five things there. The devil, the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of this darkness, and then the last one, evil spiritual forces in the heavens. What's that context? Well, the context is not your personal spiritual world. He's, the context he's talking about is the whole world. Now, our personal world does fit into that. 
but he's talking about something much bigger than our personal spiritual battle. He's talking about the spiritual battle throughout the whole creation. He's talking about these spiritual offensive weapons of praying in the spirit and the word of God, the sword of the spirit. It's not just about me. It's about the whole world. We need to have a bigger understanding of this spiritual battle. It's not just the thing I'm struggling with, although it includes that. Prayer, praying in the spirit, he says, pray at all times in the spirit, verse 18. And he's he's saying, take up the the sword of the spirit, the word of God. He's talking about using them in the the, the battle that is, is bigger than our world, but although it includes our world. So, a word from God or the word of God? And I think this can make, this can define the difference between what we're talking about. So, so we can all have a word from God. Prophecy is clear from the Bible that it continues into the New Testament, although the nature of prophecy does change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3 says, the purpose, if, to speak a prophetic word, It's for our strengthening, our encouragement, and our comfort. That is the purpose or the outcome of prophecy. But prophecy in the Old Testament is something different. So, but what the point I'm making is that we can have a word from God. We can have a word, a prophetic word that encourages, that lifts us up. We, you know, Jesus said when he talked about the the work of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes, he says he, he will take the things of Jesus and declare them to us. He says that he will, he, will, he will guide us into all the truth. So the Spirit is at work and he can give us personal prophetic words. So we can receive a word from God. But the word of God, this phrase that Paul uses, is something different. He's talking about something a lot larger. The word that comes from God, spoken under the empowerment of the Spirit of God, and specifically the message of Jesus. So we can have a a word from God, personal, and it can be powerful, and it can be life-changing. But when we think about the word of God, it's always got to be centered on the message of Jesus. Now, this is an example of how we frame it. Now, this is, this is how the Christian and Missionary Alliance have framed the message of Jesus for 100 years. Now, other church movements might frame it slightly differently, but... This is how the Christian Missionary Alliance do it, and they call it the four, fourfold gospel. Jesus Christ, our Saviour. So Jesus Christ has saved us from our sins. Jesus Christ, our sanctifier. So Jesus Christ, and they, they include in sanctification the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, but the, 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 the Jesus Christ you know, shapes us into his image. Over a journey, but also as uh, also included in a in a distinct event as well. Jesus Christ, our healer. So Jesus Christ has come. Part of the gospel, part of the message of Jesus, is that He can heal us from sicknesses and diseases. Is that a, is it a guarantee? No. We live in a fallen world. We live in an evil fallen world. It's not guaranteeing it, but He has made allowance for that in the atonement. Jesus Christ, our coming king. Jesus Christ is king and he's coming back. So now that is a snapshot of one way that, you know, we uh, uh, articulate the message of Jesus. And as I said, other uh, churches, denominations will uh, articulate it maybe slightly differently. But that is the essence of of what we're talking about when we're talking about the message of Jesus. It is the gospel spoken under the empowerment of the Spirit that is the effective weapon against the kingdom of darkness. 
This is, this is what I keep wanting to reinforce. It's not just, um, can I just have my Bible? It's not just reading the Bible. It's not just believing it. When we talk about the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit as an effective weapon, it's something that's spoken. And it's something that's, that, uh, that is empowered by the Spirit. That's what makes it effective as a weapon. It's not just finding a verse in the, in the Scriptures and saying, and reading it out. It's, not, well, it's, it's actually what God has put in your heart. What happened when Peter got up, filled with the Spirit, inspired by the Spirit to speak? What did he speak? He spoke Scripture. He quoted from Joel chapter 2. If you look at the New Testament, all through the scriptures, the writers of the scriptures quote scripture, either quote it direct, directly or they uh, make allusions to scripture. All through it. How do you think that happened? They were reading scripture. They had scripture in their heart. I don't believe for a second Peter had never read Joel before and it just came to him. Now, could do, God do that? Yeah, I guess he could. But I believe that at some point he'd meditated on Joel chapter 2 and in that point the Holy Spirit inspired him, brought it to his heart and his mind and he spoke it out and that was the word of the Lord. That was the word of God. That was the effective weapon. To have the word of God in your mouth, you need to have scripture in your heart. That's what I'm saying. To have the word of God in your mouth, you need to have the scriptures in your heart. Let's just have a look at a uh, passage in scripture in Romans chapter 10. Now, the context of this where Paul writes in Romans chapter 10 is, is Paul's explaining really the failure of Israel not to be faithful to God. And, and basically their attempt at earning their own righteousness before God instead of receiving the righteousness of God by faith, okay? And he says this, verse uh, 8, the message or the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. So he's talking about the message that him and his apostolic team are preaching throughout the churches. Verse 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then further down in verse 13, he says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then 17, So faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes from the message about Christ or the Messiah. So what Paul's talking about, he uses, and if you read the whole, all the verses, you, you get this. Uh, but he's, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it talks about, uh, in Deuteronomy, how the word, the Torah, uh, the first five books of the Bible, including uh, of the, the Old Testament, including the Ten Commandments, the word of God was near the Israelites. They had it there. The problem was, is not that they, it was far off, that they had to go far. The problem was, they never got it in their heart. They never got God's word in their heart, his law in their heart in the Old Testament. And the, reason, and, and the outcome of that was then they tried to outwork their own righteousness from what they do, their performance, as opposed to receiving it by faith. And Paul uses that analogy and applies it to his current context. The reason why Israel, he didn't see, 
a lot, most of the Jews coming to faith in Jesus, and, and it actually applies to everyone, actually, not just Jews, but Gentiles, not non-Jewish people. The reason why is because we don't get to put the word in our heart. But what does Paul say? He says the message, and this is a, it's basically a direct quote from Deuteronomy 30, the message is near you. It's right near you. The message of Jesus is near you. If it's going to be effective, it needs to be in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message of faith that we preach. For us to preach an effective message, we need to have the scriptures in our heart and then they need to come out of our mouth. Do you get it? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes from the message about Christ. The mouth confesses what our heart has believed by faith. So what's this got to do with the word of God, the sword of the spirit? Well, for us to, to, to pick up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, requires us to get the scriptures in our heart, to believe them, to receive them, and then speak them out of our mouth. That's what I'm saying. The message about Jesus is first heard. So if, unless we hear it, we need to hear it first. And then we need to believe, we need to receive that word that we heard. We need to believe it and receive it into our heart. And then we need to speak it out of our mouth. That's what he's talking about. Until you have revelation in your heart, no head explanation will satisfy you. So that's why I'm saying just teaching the scriptures without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit will not bring revelation. It will just fill your head with more Bible knowledge. You need revelation, and revelation comes from where? The Spirit. I shared on Facebook and Instagram this week my experience of being having the baptism, receiving the baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1993. And uh, if you want to know about it, just go onto my Facebook and read it. But here's the thing, right? At the same time when I had that experience, I also got a revelation about the scriptures. This was what the revelation was. It wasn't uh, complicated. It was, this is the truth. That was it. That w- that, the Holy Spirit spoke that to my heart. I just knew in my inner being that, that this was the truth. I couldn't explain it to you. I couldn't give you ten reasons why. But I believed it. Why? Because it was a revelation. It came from God. That, that revelation came from God. It wasn't. No one said that. No one convinced me, had a conversation and convinced me that the truth. No, that came from God. It was a revelation. The last 30 years have been me understanding why that's the truth. Do you get what I'm saying? So I, I want to believe why that's the truth in my head, but that's no substitute for revelation in your heart. Until you get revelation in your heart, no head explanation will satisfy. That's why, you know, if you convince people with their head why they should believe in Jesus, they'll go down, they'll go through, down a journey and then someone will come along and convince them why, why Jesus is not true. There's no revelation. You need revelation. And add the teaching to that. The Holy Spirit is the the perfect teacher anyway. He teaches, but he teaches our heart. 
So I'm not against teaching. I believe in teaching. I'm not against Bible study. I believe in Bible study. But it has to be more than that. It has to be revelation from our heart. You know, speaking of revelation, the book of Revelation in chapter 12 says, verse 11, it says that that they conquered him. They meaning believers, him being Satan, they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, which is the death of Jesus, by the word of their testimony, what they spoke out about what they believed, and they did not love their lives to death. In other words, they lived for Jesus, and if it meant going and being um, martyred for him, they would. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So, just in finishing, just in summary, how do we use the word of God as a weapon? Number one is we need to keep on hearing the message of Jesus preached with or under the empowerment of the Spirit. If we're talking about having the Word of God in our heart to use as a weapon out of our mouth, we need to keep on hearing the message of Jesus, and and there's a whole lot in that, preached in the inspiration of the Spirit. Number two, we need to receive and believe the Scriptures in our heart. We need to get them in our heart. You know, and, and that means that we need to be diligent in all the forms of getting those in our heart, whether that's private uh, uh, Bible reading and meditation and, and, and or, or praying over scriptures or hearing, you know, great preaching and also teaching. Whatever way that is, the important thing is we need to receive them, the truth, the truth of God and, and believe it and get it in our heart and then... We need to speak the word of God out of our mouth. If we never speak it out of our mouth, it's all for nothing in terms of it being a weapon. If we're going to pick up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, it's at some point got to, what's in our hearts got to come out of our mouth. Let me tell you, the enemy will do anything he can to stop you getting it in your heart and stop you speaking it out of your mouth. And the last thing is we need to fight against spiritual apathy and passivity. Spiritual apathy and passivity is an enemy. What does apathy mean? Well, apathy is, uh, it's an attitude. I'm not interested or I'm unwilling to act. Passivity is an action, is that we don't act, we just lay down and do nothing. And that can be what can happen where, particularly where we're in a spiritual battle. We just lay down and do nothing. But that's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to the fight. He's, he's given us weapons. We need to use them. See, this is where we need to sp- build spiritual habits into our life. Because otherwise we remain passive and apathetic. We need to, you know, do you know the habits? Do you know habits? Do you know you live by habits? You, are, you live, all of us live habitual lives. But most of our habits, and there's good ones and there's bad ones, but most of us are unaware of the habits that we live We just because we just do them. That's why they're habits. We don't even think about it. We need to develop spiritual habits, things that we do that we don't even give a second thought to. Prayer needs to be, I would say, the first one. We need to build habits in our life of praying. So we do that whether we feel like it or not. Reading our Bibles, absolutely. Being in a context of, of empowered, hearing empowered uh, by the Spirit's message, the message of Jesus. 
You know, our con- spiritual context is so important. Do you know, part of the job is just to get ourselves in a place where we're hearing people that are filled with the Spirit talk about Jesus. That's half the battle because we're hearing. We've got to put ourselves in a place where we're hearing. All of us, if we don't put ourselves in that place, we become apathetic because, the, because apathy and passivity, spiritually speaking, is the environment that we live in. Everything in the world will want you to lay down and give up. Not Jesus and not the kingdom of God. Here's an example. One of the things that I've tried to build as a habit in my life is fasting. So I now fast regularly. And it could be at different lengths of time. And I'm trying to build that as a habit into my life. This is what I've found. If I don't fast, let's say we have February fast, so we fast for a month. If I don't fast for 12 months, when I come round to do that fast, I, I've not eaten overnight. So that my last meal is dinner. By lunchtime the next day, I've got headaches. My stomach is groaning all over the place. And by nighttime, I've given up. That's what happens. I haven't built that into my life. I'm weak in that area. But I need to build that habit in my life. So I fast regularly. So now I don't have a problem fasting for a day or two days. No problem. I don't particularly feel hungry. I don't get headaches. Uh, You know, particularly if I've been fasting... Uh, you know, you know, in the, the preceding months. But here's the thing. If I give up for no, six months, I'm back there. I'm back there. Given up by, by dinner time. That's a habit. We need to build these spiritual habits in our life if we want to win the spiritual war. How, how much does the energy does it take for you to pray? At the start, it's hard work, man. It may, takes determination. But over the, over, if you keep on, it becomes a habit. It's just something I do. Every morning, every morning, every morning, every morning, I get up and pray. Every morning. I don't miss it unless I'm sick. Every morning. Every morning. Every morning, I pray. I can tell you, five years ago, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't. But now I am because I've built the habit into my life. We need to fight against spiritual apathy and passivity and build those habits into our life so we can become strong spiritually. The word of a God, the word of God, and, and, and that obviously, obviously includes the scriptures, need to be in our heart. And then as we speak, as, as we pray, and as we face these spiritual fights, the, the scriptures that God has put in our heart, he brings out as a word from him, inspired by the spirit, and we speak it out and becomes a weapon cutting through the spiritual darkness, either for ourselves or through other people. So that's all I'm going to share this morning. Uh, I want us to pray to finish. Lord, I thank you that your word is living and powerful.